Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, good morning, gentlemen. I'm pleased to uh, introduce, if you don't know, uh, Professor Seth Goldstein, uh, who taught yesterday um, on Brain in the Bottle, and now is going to talk about some other of his work in systems now and technology. It's the bigger picture, I think uh, he prefers to call it, in realizing claytronics. So without further ado, I'll just hand over to Seth and, and we'll get going. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, this is a project that actually has a lot of people involved, as I'm sort of representing a group. Um, this, the, we started this project about four years ago, and um, there was a sort of, you know, looking for a market need for the research. Uh, we were thinking about um, the desire for people to communicate with each other, and the fact that we're often not in the same room, as is true now, I gather. Um, so from a computer science point of view, uh, we can think about the telephone as being sort of an abstract communication device um, where it senses some physical phenomena. In the case of the telephone, it senses sound waves, encodes them as a string of uh, ones and zeros, uh, sends it over the net, and then there's some uh, actuator that takes that string of ones and zeros and turns it into that same a a simulacrum of the physical phenomenon. So it's not the exact same sound waves, but it's a representation of those sound waves that fools the listener into thinking that they're actually talking to the person. So this uh, telephone's been around for a long time, and it's sort of a bummer because it really hasn't changed much in 100 years. I mean, despite some recent stuff in you know, video conferencing and such, it's basically the same device that it's always been. And um, that uh, seems like a crime, because basically the telephone is just a computer, right? So we were thinking about how we could improve the telephone. Um, and basically, from this abstract point of view, I mean, the telephone takes voice to voice. It has an, uh, its actuators are speakers. Uh, that's something that's easy to do. Televideo essentially takes photons and sounds and uses a monitor and speakers to make a representation of the input phenomena. And if we want to take that next step, we need to, what we call telepario, capture not just the sound waves and the photons, but also, let's say, a 3D model of whatever it is that is uh, being captured. And now we need a new kind of output device that can recreate that physical uh, phenomena that it captured. So it's not cloning. It's not the exact same thing but it's something that has physical form and can change dynamically. So you could have a conversation with someone, you wouldn't know whether they're there or they're somewhere else and they're being uh, reproduced. We call this material claytronics. That's what this talk is about. To give you an idea, because that was sort of abstract, uh, I have here a, uh, uh, a video that was put together for us by the Entertainment Technology Center at CMU. And this is, uh, none of this is real, it's all CGI. But just to give you an idea of what's going on, those spheres which have been shrinking down to a small size, each one is one unit of claytronics. I'll sometimes refer to that as a claytronic atom. Okay, and so you can imagine you have lots and lots of these things, and they're in this, uh, set into this table, so there's this sort of uh, whole pile of them in the table, and these people are sitting around a table designing a car. But instead of drawing it on a screen, looking at 3D representations, they actually have this claytronic stuff so they can touch it and feel it and move it around. And every one of these units has a computer in it, it's running computations, so the constraints that you would put into the CAD program are essentially running on the claytronics. So you'll see, for instance, when they change the shape of the trunk or the window, everything else moves in proportion. It's not just like Play-Doh. It's actually computational material or what we call programmable matter. Um, in addition to having physical form and being able to sense its environment and change shape, it can also change color. So that's how we could do the, reproduce the, uh, the fact that you might be in, you know, not be in the same room but appear to be in the same room. So this is the sort of... Uh, the broad picture. 
Um, and this, to me, is sort of one of the nearer-term applications of Quitronics. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, in short, Claytronics is one instance of the broad class of materials of programmable matter. It's a programmable material. It can actuate. It can sense the environment. And most importantly, it can, under the guide, you know, by running a program, it can change its shape or form. And there's other instances of programmable matter as well, um, <coughs> which I'll talk about in a minute. So just to go over one more time, sort of the high-level, long-term goal uh, capture a 3D object, encode it as a 3D model, transmit it over the wire, all that stuff is stuff that other people have worked on or is working already. And the idea here is to recreate that. In the near term, the individual units might be large, and so you'll get this coarse grain representation just the way video screens used to have really big pixels. Uh, and then over time, the individual units will get smaller and more finer grained, and you'll get a better, uh, higher fidelity resolution. So like any good research project, you should know when you can declare a victory. And uh, I like to think of uh, the victory dance here will be done when we're sort of can pass the Turing test for appearance. So when you can't tell whether I'm here or I'm back in Pittsburgh, because the units are fine grained enough and there's enough of them. And uh, I have sufficient physical form that I can exert forces uh, here instead of there. So as I said, Claytronics is one instance of programmable matter. Um, you know, you could think of modular robots as another instance of this. I mean, it's just very coarse-grained pixels or voxels, so to speak. Uh, you know, down at the nanoscale, people have been designing molecules that can be influenced by their environment to change their shape, change their electrical properties, change their optical properties. And, and all of these things share the property that sort of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The individual units are quite useless and, and meaningless, but when you put them together, you get something very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the uh, sort of demand pull side. Um, as far as the technology push side, uh, it sounds very fantastic, but I think this isn't a matter of if we get there, it's a matter of when we get there. And so it, I'm agnostic about what we will, build programmable materials out of in the long range. But in the near term, we can think of using photolithography. I mean, these are essentially computers. And you know, Moore's Law is pretty amazing. Um, <coughs> so amazing that I think it's hard to metabolize what it really means. So I like to think about Moore's Law in pictures. You know, 1972, the Cray 1. In the late 90s, the PlayStation 2. You know, equal powers, equal amount of performance. You know, one of them you could plug into the wall. If you go back further, the Apollo 11, the Furby. Uh, I mean, this is pretty amazing. If we go back further in time to like the ENIAC, and then, you know, today you can go into a uh, stationary store and buy these little musical greeting cards. This one's falling apart. So the, the amazing thing about this is it's not just, it doesn't just have more computational power than this room full of hardware which had a mean time to failure of two minutes and cost many millions of dollars and required a power substation and all that kind of stuff. But this also has a sensor. It knows when I opened up the card. It has an actuator, a speaker. It's a self-contained power support source. In a sense, it's a disposable computer. And uh, you know the, the paper costs as much as the processor, practically, uh, in this kind of situation. So you know we keep moving down this road, and uh, the, these individual units, if we can somehow use photolithography to make them, ought to be inexpensive and have plenty of room on them to put as much processing power and communication and stuff as you would want. So our goal right now, anyway, is to think about how to harness sort of the monolithic manufacturing process that you get from photolithography to create programmable matter, or at least this kind of programmable matter, claytronics. And uh, the, the sort of driving mantra of everything we do in the group is about scaling. So it's scaling both up in numbers, okay, that's really the software challenge. If I'm going to be represent, you know, if I'm going to be composed of millions and millions of units, and there have to be millions and millions of them because they're all very tiny to represent all of the, my details, I have to come up with programming models and methods that will allow me to control million, you know, this sort of massively distributed system. And it's a, not only is it a massively distributed system, but it has to work in the uncertainty of the environment. 
Um, so that's the software challenge, scaling up in numbers, and then of course there's the hardware challenge of reducing the size of this essentially a robot down to uh, sub-millimeter dimensions. So I'm going to talk about both of those things. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about the hardware challenge, just so that I can hopefully convince you that this is a when, and when is actually fairly soon. So that way we can all think about what I think is really the fundamentally harder challenge, and that is the software challenge. So we want to use Moore's law. Uh, and the, the, the immediate sort of gotcha that you think about is the fact that we need to create 3D objects, right? These essentially we can think of as spheres so that they can move around in 3D, but photolithography is a 2D printing process. It creates 2D objects, dyes. Okay. Um, so when I initially sort of posed this challenge, um, uh, a few years ago, there was a researcher at AFRL, Rob Reed, who came up with a proposed solution. And uh, he said, let's start off with uh, silicon on insulator wafers. These are sort of standard wafers you can buy for any standard uh, lithography process. Um, <coughs> the thing about silicon on insulator wafers is it's a layer of, very thin layer of silicon, and then a layer of insulator, which is like silicon dioxide, for instance, and then the rest of the wafer. And so the idea here would be to print on top of this insulator our die, but instead of making it a square or rectangular die, let's make it in the shape of this flower. Okay. And if we, if we do the right thing here, we should have enough area on this for our processor and everything else. And then we'll do a process where we lift off the die off of the bottom insulator, and you can engineer the stress of those layers so it will curl into a ball. Actually, sort of MEMS... In general, uh, MEMS, which is microelectrical mechanical uh, systems, uh, devices tend to either have to fight the stress that's always there or harness the stress. So we just want to harness the stress. And so this is a great uh, picture. So um, in fact, he's a he actually made one, and that's a really old picture. I should update that. But instead, I can actually show you a movie about recent progress. Uh, so you can see that looks a lot nicer than the one we saw on the previous page. But this is also sitting on a, uh, a board where we can put charge on these various uh, wires, which are these dark lines, and use electrostatic forces to move around, move the sphere around. So just so that we're uh, clear about what I'm claiming here, this is just a demonstration of the manufacturing process. There's no transistors on this thing. This is just pure silicon, essentially. And so it's being moved around with an external source. And so, of course, the challenge is to get all the this external field generation and the processor and everything onto that, onto that die. But the basic idea of creating a, uh, a 3D object out of this 2D process is possible. Um, so I, I should, uh, this is more recent work. We started off the project by thinking about how to make our lives easier. Let's not be at the millimeter scale. Uh, let's think about what we could do at a slightly larger scale, and also let's not worry about going in 3D. Let's just work on the plane and test out some of our principles. So one of the things that is important, to, I think, to succeeding here is to make each of the units as simple as possible. I know these don't look that simple, but in this case, the idea was to avoid all mo moving parts. So I want to make it as simple as possible. In that sphere, I'm not going to have any moving parts, and yet I want to be able to move the units. And so this is an example of uh, essentially a, a robot, the ensemble itself is, let's call that one robot, that's made out of, uh, that moves, that doesn't have any moving parts. Okay, so the way these work is these uh, coils and cores, these are essentially electromagnetics running around, the, electromagnets running around the surface, and when two, a unit wants to move around another unit, they communicate with each other, turn, polarize their magnets in the right direction, of course, also communicate with the other robots to sort of hold on to each other so that you have a bigger mass over here and they can start moving together. So the idea here is sort of what we call the ensemble principle, that we can sacrifice some functionality of the individual because that functionality can be made up by the group. Okay? And that way we can hopefully simplify the individual units so that sort of the expensive stuff we can throw away, the stuff that's likely to fail or be hard to manufacture, and replace that with essentially software. So we make the software problem harder. 
And so this is a little video of those robots uh, performing the first sort of um, uh, shape transformation, if you want to sort of stretch your imagination a little bit, right? They go from a line to a triangle to a line. Um, and they do that by communicating with each other and turning their magnets on, the right polarities moving around. Um, so that was uh, work that's now maybe a year or so old. Uh, we're pushing harder on the submillimeter scale robots now. Um, we're also building larger robots, but we're pushing hard on this. Um, and the idea here is to, again, simplify the, the problem. So instead of starting to try and build a sphere directly and move around in 3D, we want to verify that we can use electrostatics to do all the things we want it to do, uh, and we'll do it in a cylinder instead. So these are pictures of some uh, more recent um, uh, devices that we fabricated um, and essentially these started out as a rectangle of silicon with the right stresses and so it curls up into the cylinder um, and uh, we're in the process of taping out something that will have uh, enough computation and actuators on it so that it'll be able to either roll clockwise or counterclockwise depending on what the frequency of the signal is that it hears. Uh, this is just a, the same thing as the previous one where it's externally actuated. So we want to take all of that electronics and put it inside. Um, let me just talk about this one mechanism that I've said a few times, electrostatics, and show you how this one mechanism can actually solve almost all of our problems as far as sensing and actuation go. Um, the computation still has to happen on a processor, but I think this one mechanism solves both our need to have things to adhere to each other. If this is going to be made up of millions of individual units, they have to be able to stick together. Uh, to move around each other, to communicate with each other, and also to transfer power to make sure everyone has sufficient energy to carry out their tasks. Okay. So imagine I have two units, uh, this blue unit and this pink unit, and they're next to each other. And we're going to design them such that at the surface there are essentially metal plates. These metal plates are right on the surface and they're covered by a dielectric, some kind of insulator. And um, will arrange it so that the processor can, using switches, can put arbitrary charge on any one of those plates. Okay, so the way it's going to carry out its various tasks is by distributing charge in some kind of smart manner. Okay, so if uh, I just look at two of these plates here from each one of these, I d deposit oppositely charged particles on them, and they're going to stick together. So that's pretty easy, right? That's, you know, I rub a balloon, I put it on the wall, it sticks to the wall. As you shrink down in size, and the surface area to volume ratio gets bigger and bigger, you can actually get significant forces here that hold these together. I mean, these are the forces that hold us together, so it should, should work. Um, if I want to rotate these, then I just have to play with this charge. So, if, for instance, instead of just trying to stick together, I could make these charges opposite in polarity and these charges the same, and then that would cause the blue uh, one and the pink one to rotate together towards the top of the page. Okay, so it's the same underlying hardware being used for both adhesion and actuation. So communication is maybe a little bit less obvious, but uh, if we put an AC signal across these two blue plates, essentially what these two plates are are capacitors, right? There's just two plates separated by a dielectric. So any kind of charge I put on one side is going to be mirrored on the other side. So if I essentially uh, put an AC signal on one side, it's going to be mirrored on the other side, and so I can use that to do both communication. I can just modulate the frequency or amplitude of that, and I can also do it to do power transfer. So, you know, this AC signal causes a load to be dropped on that resistor. I mean, it wouldn't be a resistor, right? it would be some more complicated circuit. But the idea is that the uh, center of these units is uh, filled with a supercapacitor to hold, that holds significant amount of charge, and as things run out of charge, they send requests to be sent packets of power, and their neighbors send them power. Uh, in the example that I started with, where you had that uh, stuff in the conference table, you can imagine the surfaces of that box are pumping power in by these AC waves, and then the, surf the, catam the units near the surface are sending that throughout the entire ensemble, so everybody gets power. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's uh, very inefficient, and almost all of our heat will come for this, but it's efficient enough, and the supercapacitors are big enough that we don't have to spend all of our time sending power around. It, no, the other thing is, is that you only need to power the units, you only need to really send significant power to the units on the surface. The ones inside don't really have to do very much. They just have to be there for routing, essentially. And so it's not like you have to make sure everybody's getting power throughout the entire ensemble. The nice thing about, I mean, depend, assuming you're not like operating in, in water or something, is that when you put the charge on the plates, you can leave it there. And so they'll stick together without having to do anything active. OK, so just as a sanity check to make sure that this is, is basically possible, we can sort of do a basic evaluation of how much area we have on this unit. So that would tell us how many transistors we can get and how much it's going to weigh. And you can just do some basic calculations to figure out what you get. So for instance, uh, we'd have enough area in a 90 nanometer process uh, yeah, in a 90 nanometer process to get, you know, something like an RM7 and about uh, 256K of memory, which is a lot more processor than, you know, this industry started out with. And that's, that's in a 90 nanometer process. If we go to a 65 or a 45 nanometer process, we just, you know, we have more than we need in some sense. Um, if we calculate the kinds of forces we can generate if we put sort of uh, metal plates along the surface for that, uh, for doing that capacitive coupling, uh, we should be able to move it about five body lengths a second, which is pretty impressive for a robot, right? I mean, that's 30 feet a second for me is five body lengths, right? Um, and we can use this for communication. Uh, essentially, for the power distribution, if we do this thing right, it takes about uh, a microsecond to fill up the supercapacitor. If you start, if there's a full one talking to an empty one, it takes about a microsecond. So you have plenty of time to to do other stuff. And the supercapacitor itself would hold enough energy to execute about 200 million instructions or to move about 2 million body lengths. So this is very much in the realm of practicality. I mean, it's just a matter of doing it in some sense. But the five body lengths wouldn't be enough for that, for that uh, 2012 video, would it be? I mean, the speed of... Yeah, so the group points. velocity can be even bigger in some sense, right? Well, but, um, if, you have, if the top of the car has to go up by this much in a second, then you will have something will have to move faster than 500 feet. Okay, so uh, that's pulling yourself up around against gravity. So you can actually do something what we call collective actuation. You can imagine if you put... Uh, let's say six of these spheres in a three by two row and you rotate the outer two, right, then you're going to get this leverage effect to get more force, but also at some point you'll get less force but faster movement. And so we can do things like that to get things to move faster. In that video, I imagine a lot of that force is coming from the fingers. It's being directed, actually. So. Uh, and so maybe that video, two th I said 2012, so what, I have four years, so, you know. We'll get better too. Are there any? The, have you, since you've done these uh, calculations, these things yeah. have to be very light. They're very light right now. Uh, actually, so we assume a, a density of water because the supercapacitor itself is not, it's actually lighter than water, but just as a worst case, we assume water. And then how would that interact with your fingers when you have your fingers? <coughs> actually, like they wouldn't look like this. After we would sort of finish making the sphere, we would polymerize it, and it would essentially be like a glass bead. So it wouldn't feel like skin, that's for sure. Although, uh, you know, our sense of touch has less to do with what we're touching than the vibrations that it makes when we move across it. I'm, I'm more, I mean more of the consistency. Would you, would, you, would you have to be very careful how you're touching oh, it? Oh, so to our calculations show that if we, if, not at a millimeter, but at something a little bit smaller than a millimeter, we could actually, it's like be, it would appear to be like a credit card. So it would have that Young's modulus. So it would be pretty stiff. It would be good. So you couldn't make a hammer out of it, probably. Well, you could make a crappy hammer out of it. Any other questions about the hardware? OK, so that was the easy part. <laughs> now comes the hard part. Uh, <coughs> so there's two 
uh, broad areas that we can that the software challenges fall into. So uh, the one on the bottom about programming the unit is a general problem that all robots have, right? I mean, just programming robots to do the right thing is hard. There's no question about it. But lots of people are tackling that. And so we're not really focused on that. I mean, we do have to program individual units, but we're not, the, our research isn't really pushing in this uh, direction. What we're really focused on is programming the ensemble. We've got thousands or millions of units, and how do we get them to act like a coordinated whole? And that's, uh, that's one of the main sort of scientific challenges of, of the project. So <clears throat> there's two uh, ways that we can approach this, and one very, at least, uh, deceptively attractive method is to try and do things that are called emergent uh, behavior, where you have a program for an individual unit, you have a whole bunch of units that work together, and you get this amazing effect you know, birds flocking, ants going back to the food and finding the shortest path around obstacles. I mean, all kinds of things from biology. Uh, and this is an example of how that emergent behavior might work. On the left here is this one statement program in a language that we're developing called MELD, which is sort of, uh, you could think of it as a descendant of data log. Um, it looks a lot like prologue. Essentially, you have some facts that you want to prove and then the means to prove them. And unlike in a purely uh, logic programming language, some facts, if you prove them, have side effects. So for instance, this fact here that we're trying to prove is actually a system primitive, where if you prove move around x, y, p, it moves the unit at x, the unit that x stands for, around unit y to this point. Okay? So if you ever can satisfy all of these requirements, x moves around y to point. And, that, and the reason why it's like this is they can't move on their own, right? They have to coordinate with their neighbors. So x moves around y to some point. So what does this program say, basically? It says, first of all, that x and y have to be neighbors to prove that. Well, if you're going to move x around y, they better be neighbors. So that seems pretty uh, reasonable. And then we have these other facts that are actually we could, sort of underlying facts that the system provides you with that have to do with your sensors. So if you remember Prolog, if you have something that's unknown, it's filled in, essentially, when it gets proven. So here we say that the brightness level at, cat at the unit X is N, and the brightness le level at unit Y is M. Okay, so we essentially just did readings from some photosensors we had. And then we want to make sure that point is vacant. In other words, uh, at the, at the point that's next to Y is vacant. There's no one there. Okay, so if all of these things are true, X is next to Y, and there's a nobody sitting at point, and the brightness level at X is less than the brightness level at M, then we will have proved this fact and X will move to point. Okay, this is a very simple program. Right? We're reading some photosensor, so we're sensing the environment. Yeah, this is just some example. So the idea we wanted is to make this ensemble phototropic. Okay? So here's a light bulb, here's our ensemble, and uh, the ensemble moves to the light bulb. Okay, so you'll notice a couple of things about this program. And these are the things that make this sort of emergent behavior type program so attractive. It doesn't say anything about obstacle avoidance. It doesn't say anything about trying to fit through holes. And yet, you know, this is, by the way, these are, sorry, these are two views, right, from the back and the front. But yet the ensemble goes through this hole, it avoids all these obstacles, and, and makes its way to the light bulb. So it's, these programs are very, very robust. It's also nice and short. I mean, it's a very short program. It doesn't take up a lot of resources. It doesn't even do anything about, say, like, it could be that X is, is, is uh, it doesn't say which point around Y. It could be that X is, and Y are like this, and it's brighter over there, and then X moves away from the light. It just picks a random point. It's just that over, you know, over time, and generally, dimmer units are moving to brighter areas. Okay. It also doesn't say anything about keeping things connected, and you notice we lose some units here. Okay. If we want to make sure that they also stay connected, this takes like about four lines instead of one. I can't fit that on the slide. But this is, you know, one of the things about emergent behavior type programs, sort of these programs that use stochastic properties, is you have to be willing to sacrifice some individuals. So you're never going to use this behavior to like balance your bank accounts, even if you had a million bank accounts. <clears throat> I don't think this is the right approach. People have been thinking about emergent behavior. In some sense, you could think that 
Cellular automata is also an example of emergent behavior, right? You have these small little rule sets, you put some pixels down like in the game of life and you get these cool things that come. But we still don't have any general methods for proving what the ensemble effect is from the individual programs. People are trying hard and, have, and lots of smart people have been trying very hard for a long time. And it, it seems daunting to me. So what I think the attributes of, this, of the right kind of programming thing is you want it to be ensemble level thinking. This isn't really ensemble level thinking. You're sort of writing this one rule and you're seeing what happens. And I think that's what we need to do. This, the one positive attribute of this program is it's very small, so it's concise. And it's certainly scalable. No matter how many units I have, this is going to work well. This program is not amenable to proof. I don't know how to prove that the entire ensemble is going to move to the light based on this one-line program. But I think that's a necessary thing. When we're talking about programs where, that are distributed across thousands or millions of units, I think we want to be able to try and prove something about them. So by necessity, given the, our proof, sort of our automated proof, uh, you know, theorem provers and such, we need to make these programs as short and concise as possible. And finally, we would like to make them something that this thing does have is robust to uncertainty, you know, environmental uncertainty, failures, defects, etc. If we've got millions of units, inevitably we're going to have lots of failures. Okay. At a very high level, uh, what I, I and also when I'm trying to pat myself on the back, I guess. I feel like what we're trying to do here is come up with some kind of thermodynamics of computing. Okay, so because thermodynamics is this really great property that it's you we think about ensembles as ensembles. So it's an, it, it embodies ensemble level thinking. If I have a box of gas and I want to double its temperature, I do not think about the gas particles and how I should tweak their velocities. I just say I want to take this box and I want to have the volume. And I know that by controlling this aggregate behavior, the behavior of the entire ensemble, I'm going to double the temperature of the, of the ensemble. And that's the same way I would like to think about programming thousands or millions of processors. So have sort of ensemble level knobs, have the compiler figure out how to translate that into the programs that run on each of the individual units. Just like when I have the volume of that box, all of a sudden the velocities start doubling because they're bouncing against each other more. There's more energy in the box in some sense. Okay. So, you know, this, this idea of ensemble level thinking has been around in, you know, physics and chemistry and thermodynamics for a long time. They deal with 10, you know, to the 23 elements. So it makes it, you know, it's sort of quite, if you don't do ensemble level thinking, you can't reason about it at all. Traditional computer science is focused on one unit you know, one robot, one thread. I mean, we have trouble writing programs for four cores or, you know, a, a 16 processors. And so this idea of trying to get an ensemble effect to control ensembles with some kind of, at the ensemble level is sort of the grand goal of this, of this, uh, this, this sort of software part of this project. Okay, so I've sort of described these, the fact, what I think the program should have. And of course, that means we need to work on compiler technology that takes these sort of ensemble level uh, descriptions and compiles them to the individual units and manages the message flow and where state is stored and all that kind of stuff. As soon as the programmer has to start worrying about that kind of stuff, you're, you're host. Uh, and then I think also we want to somehow in the algorithms, we want to harness the fact that it's a distributed problem with lots and lots of actors instead of fighting it. So if we think about this, this uh, program here, uh, it's, it's using the fact there's lots of these elements. If there was just two elements here, you wouldn't make any progress to the light with any, you know, it would take forever maybe if it did work, right? We're using the fact that there's lots and lots of them. Okay. So uh, let me give you something concrete. Uh, I'm going to talk about a programming language that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, and... Uh, uh, it's, it's very different than the sort of imperative approach that, you know, where everything is focused on the unit. Okay? So I'm going to just, to start off, I'm going to, I've already sort of described, meld to you a little bit. You know, we have these facts that we want to prove and the means by which we prove them. Uh, and this, this is a tiny little program that gets three units to, to move to some point. Okay? So it's not, uh, it's not thousands of units and it doesn't really scale. But basically the idea, for instance, is we prove some fact that says that, 
unit S has some distance D from the destination, right? So S is at point P, and we calculate the Euclidean distance for D. So that's very simple. And then we have two units, S and T, and if they're neighbors, and S has some distance, and T has some distance, and S's distance is greater than T's distance, then we say that S is further away from the destination than T. And so then we can move S around T to some point U if S is further than T and S is further than U and T and U aren't the same. Okay, so it's a very simple program that gets these three, you know, actually could be more than three units, to walk towards the destination. And that takes about four pages of C++ code. So what's being hidden under the covers here? Well, uh, the, the various facts that we've proven are distributed amongst the units. So they're not sitting in one central database. You know, the distance that S has and the distance that T have are sitting on two different units. Somehow S and T have to communicate that. So they've got to figure out what's going on. So all of that message traffic has to be done. When S does move around T, then S has a new destination. We've got to delete the old fact that S had and then reestablish its new distance. So all of that management of state and message distribution is handled sort of under the covers. Okay. And so the way, uh, the way to think about this is that each of these units has their own database with their own facts, and that as the program evolves, we prove new facts and delete facts that aren't true anymore. So, you know, A has facts like it has neighbors B and C, and it's at some point. Uh, and if I move A, then I have to delete the fact that, uh, uh, that B has neighbor A and that A has neighbor B and that B A was at some point because it's now at some new point. Okay, so all that is managed by the compiler. Um, <coughs> So the way that basically it's very fairly straightforward right now, our compiler is still pretty naive. Uh, the way things are broken up is that we run the rules on one of these units. We could arbitrarily have pick any of them, but generally it's the first unit that we run it on. And then we create uh, versions of these units that run rules that run on the remote units. They prove their piece of it and they sort of transmit it back to the unit that they know this rule is running on. Okay, and so that's how we manage to distribute the state. Uh, handling deletion and, and side effects is uh, a talk in and of itself. So I, I'm happy to talk about that offline. Okay, so let me give you sort of the high level picture of how this works and why I'm pleased to be talking about it. Uh, so one thing is obviously the programs are a lot smaller. Now we haven't written any really big programs, but you know, in the, amongst these samples of programs, you know, they're usually about 20 times shor shorter. They're short enough that you can actually think about them. You know, they're on one page of piece of paper. Uh, and also amazingly enough, the, the most important metric, which is sort of how much message traffic there is that's running between these units, basically the MELD programs do as well as the C++ programs. Okay. In fact, uh, they do at least as well as the C++ programs. So this should actually not be possible, right? If you're the perfect programmer, C++ gives you total control. Uh, you know, it's an imperative language, and you ought to do the right thing. There's no reason why MELD should ever send fewer messages. So what's the explanation for that? Well, there's two possible explanations. So particularly for, for the Morph program, which is the most complicated of these three, and essentially is a program that will change something from one shape to another, which is sort of the basic requirement for Claytronics. Uh, you'll see it's significantly fewer messages were sent by MELD than C++. So explanation number one is the person who wrote the MELD program was just smarter than the person who wrote the C++ program. That's likely to be true because I wrote the C++ program and my graduate student wrote the MELD program. So that's only part of the explanation though. I think the main reason is that the MELD program is very, very small and inherently parallel. As a matter of fact, you have to work to make it serial. Whereas the C++ program, it's a lot of pages of code and it was just easier to attack it serially because I was writing, you know, I was figuring out what every unit was doing and I wanted to avoid the sort of normal concurrency mistakes. And so as a result, it does things a little bit slower. It just takes longer to, to change from one shape to another. There's more steps performed. And so the MELD program does better. Did you have a question? Okay. So we've uh, been using MELD to write lots of um, different... Uh, applications. This is just a video showing one of the things the ensemble has to do when you boot it up is every unit has to figure out where it is. 
given the fact that you have noisy sensors and maybe defective units, you need to do that in some fairly robust way. And you'd also like it to scale to large ensembles. And so this is just something where you, we started off with this cube. They don't really know where they are. Um, we just project them in space and, at where they think they are. And so everyone sort of starts off randomly. Uh, and then units will uh, try and join up with their neighbors and do a rigid body alignment. And so this is what happens here. Okay, and so we've got uh, programs for figuring out where you are, for shape morphing, disguiding on how, where you want to go. We have debugging tools. Uh, debugging these things can be hard that are actually have turned into a language in and of themselves. In other words, this is basically, you have, uh, when you find bugs in these programs, it's generally not that there's a bug in the program on one unit, but rather there's the relationship between the state between units is an error. And so how do you figure that out? Well, what you'd like to do is write some predicate that says, you know, if A is 1 and B is 2, then C ought to be 3, that it's evaluated over the entire ensemble. And if ever that predicate is false, I mean, you think about it as like a distributed assertion, then you can stop and, and debug your program. Turns out you can also use that very efficiently for uh, writing programs. Um, so I want to talk about shape planning for just a couple of minutes because that's one of the basic things uh, we want to do uh, with the ensemble. Um, and so basically we're looking at stochastic approaches. And as I said, in addition to building these small sort of micro uh, robotic units, we've also, we're also building modular robots from scales of like uh, three or four centimeters on a side to actually two meters on a side. And all, like almost every, I shouldn't say almost, like every modular robotic system I've ever seen, the units tend to be non-holonomic. In other words, you might have two configurations that are next to each other in the configuration graph, but to get there, you've got to go all the way around. It's like, sort of like a clock is the best example. You know, between 12 and 12.01, you know, that's just one, one uh, tick on the clock. But if you want to go from 12.01 to 12, you've got to go all the way around, right? So that's a non-holonomic system. So when you have non-holonomic systems and you want to do motion planning, it can be very difficult because you think you can get to that configuration easily, but you can't. And so coming up with metrics to evaluate what path you ought to take is hard. Okay, so basically these, uh, these non-holonomic constraints make life difficult. There's also other constraints like global constraints, like if G wasn't here, E could not move to F because that would disconnect the ensemble. That's a, like a global constraint. Global constraints are actually good. They might take a while to evaluate, but they restrict the space of possible plans that you can use. Okay, and so we have developed a way that we can take any modular robotic system and create and turn it into a holonomic system essentially by creating meta modules. So we put a bunch of modules together and they act as if they were one. Um, and so this is an example of, of a, you know, like our little magnetic catoms moving around. Uh, we can't necessarily move this guy over to here in one step because it's blocked. Um, you know, you have to make lots of steps, but if we were thinking about each one of those units being a meta module composed of lots of modules, then we could. We could move this guy directly from here to here. What we have is some pre-written plans that basically say, if you want to move a unit down to this spot, then it's going to take all of its units and fill this other unit up. So this became from an empty unit to a full unit, and then it spits the unit out. So this is one step in the configuration graph. I don't have to move any other units. And so using uh, MELD, uh, we were able to write a, uh, essentially one page, a planner that works for all the modular robotic systems. Okay, so the, the reason why I sort of go through this is because the very neat thing about this MELD program is that we can prove that it's correct. Okay, and this is the thing that particularly excites me about this. So we can prove that it's complete because if there is a plan that gets you from point, you know, from shape A to shape B, we will find it. Okay? It might not be the most optimal plan. In fact, it's almost definitely not because it's stochastic, the whole planning process. Um, yeah? It's not entirely clear to me how this plan is represented and, and, and for this global plan. How is it communicated? Yeah, I haven't really told you anything about the planner. So let me, I'll discuss this and then I can finish. There's two parts to this, what we say what I mean by provably correct. So one, it's complete. If there is a plan, it'll be found. And the second one is that it's sound in the, in the sense that it'll never disconnect the ensemble. And so the fact that we can prove that about this is, to me, a positive indication we're going to make progress and we're being able to write programs 
massively distributed programs that are provably correct. And the proof right now is still some, it, it's not completely automatic, but because the translation from MELD to 12, which is a language for uh, doing uh, formal proofs by computer, uh, happens partially by hand. But we essentially translate this, and then 12 essentially proves the, proves the fact. Yes? in the presence of node failures and accidental dislocations. Good point. And, and so, so right now we just proved the algorithm works if there are no failures. So in, but this, this proof system will enable us to deal with things like node failures and, and other things as well. So we will be able to actually prove whether, how uncertain, I believe we'll be able to prove how uncertainty tolerant it is. We haven't done that yet. This is a first step. The fact that we can prove this at all is great as far as I'm concerned. The way the planner works is um, basically, the, uh, the target shape is distributed to, in this particular case, the tar everybody has a copy of where they should, not where they should be, what the target shape is. They don't know what their current shape is, but they know what their current location is. And basically, if you're next to a space that should be in the target shape and it's vacant, you ask people to send your resources, and then you spit those resources out into the target shape. Has the target shape it does, but it doesn't need to actually. Only the ones that are adjacent to the target shape need to actually have the target shape and they would propagate it. But right now, just to make it easier, everyone has a copy of it. The ones that aren't adjacent to the target shape, they don't use it at all, ever. And then the location is highly uncertain. You actually have relative location, you don't have the real location. Um, do you take yes, that's the right. So what we do is we pick one unit to be the seed unit. So, we've come, so they run a program to give themselves a consistent coordinate system. That consistent coordinate system, as you said, it's just internally consistent. Somebody's got to be told they're zero, zero, zero. And so you just pick somebody. It doesn't really matter. You could use some external reference for that. And so it's, I'm, that seems like a second order detail to me. You could have some special CADM or some special place on the, in the environment. Okay, so um, I haven't really talked about applications of this, but uh, this is a list of some of the things that we're thinking about, like a 3D fax machine, which is sort of doesn't require movement or motion, you know, all the way down to, uh, you know, not being there but appearing to be there, right? It's, it's a large collection of, of applications. But, but I think that, um, you know, in some sense, this has less to do with the applications of claytronics than understanding ensembles and scaling um, and, and forming a basis for, I mean, we, the way I like to think about it, is forming a basis for understanding how we're going to control systems with a really a lot of particles, because a million particles just isn't that many. But, you know, things in the future like systems nanotechnology and stuff. So at this point, I'll entertain more questions. I'm done. You, you, you skipped over the additional talk of, of um, tr the truth maintenance system. Um, what sort of, a, a high, at a high level, um, what's sort of going on there? Do you have, do you, do you avoid or accommodate the issues of things moving and changing too fast to keep up with the updates and the like? Um, they can't actually move, well, if the system is working, they can't move faster than the updates because they're only going to move when they have a proof for that update. Uh, and then the deletion, so communication happens faster than, than, I mean, we can actually, if you have a proof that you can move and, you're, and the system is working right, your neighbors shouldn't have proofs that they can move. So they can only start moving once you have, the, the fact that you weren't, aren't where you were is sort of propagated to the people that need to know that. Does that make sense? So there is a very, I don't know what you, about truth uh, systems, but there is a very interesting uh, thing that we're wrestling with right now, and that is the difference between belief and truth. So for instance, with that coordinate system, so everyone figures out what their con globally consistent coordinate system is, and it turned out that I happened to be the seed module at zero, 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 okay? And then I move. So now there's this big question. If I was zero, 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 
I'm still zero, zero, zero. And so I didn't actually move. Everybody else moved with respect to me. Right? I mean, there's this notion of what I believe to be true and what's true. And so, for instance, also, if I have a, my a valid coordinate system and there's no unit over here, no one has the knowledge of what that coordinate is. I could sort of infer it. So what, some of the research that we're working on right now is how you take belief that should be universally true and turn it into truth. So that if I, so once I have this consistent coordinate system and I move, I, my coordinate actually changes. I don't drag everybody else around with me, so to speak. Does that make any sense at all? Okay. So yeah. The problem that you just mentioned, it yeah. sounds like it would be better not to have one unit linked to the zero zero, not grounding the coordinate system, but to simply have a belief for every unit where it should be in some abstract coordinate system. And that belief should actually be really represent his belief in multiple hypotheses, you know, multiple hypotheses. I may be in this wheel. Or the that question is, is how do you initially seed the right hypothesis? So we start out, no one knows where they are. Randomly, they have a Exactly. So what you need to do is be able to conclude that you have enough knowledge that everyone believes the same coordinate system exists and then turn that into truth. And the hard part is that transition. Anyway, I believe that that's the hard part. As I said, this is work we're just work we're doing right now. So one way you could imagine that every, uh, every node is trying to figure out where it is in the global plan. And it, as long as it has uncertainty, you, have, you, you still have to keep on sending messages around. Once there is no uncertainty, then that can only happen if they're all in the right spot. Um, so the planner, so I would like to divorce this notion of belief and truth from the planner because that statement doesn't really hold true. The planner works in a way such that you only need to have belief for it to work. You don't actually need to have truth. But this notion of as long as there's uncertainty, you have to keep proving things. And when the uncertainty disappears, you want to turn this into truth it is the right one. The planner itself, does, you don't need to actually be globally understand that you have the, your position in the plan. The plan is stochastic and random. And this planner is not, um, it's something that's not sitting on these units, or it's sitting it on is. These units, Absolutely. each one of these units? Each one of these units is saying, what should I do? Should I move left? Should I move right? You know, oh, that, that guy over there asked for some resources. I don't have anything else to do. I'll go there. Someone else might think they want to go there, too. So we have to coordinate. And do you actually have formal representational uncertainties in that uh, no. plan or no? Because well, it, we don't have it as a first class object. We have the notion of I could move, possibly, if it's OK, and someone else has that same thing. And then we would negotiate and say, OK, I'm not going to move. So there is a sense in which we have facts that indicate uncertainty, but there's no first class sort of, you know, I believe this with X percent. But it looks to me like uh, all the literature on belief propagation and machine learning might actually be useful. I think that's true. That's exactly the problem. That's a, that's a, so there's, a, there's, um, there's multiple levels to this problem, too. There's one thing in which we all believe with 100% certainty some fact, and then we can turn that into a truth. That's also true. There's other things where I can say, I have 80% belief. And you know, if we all have 80% belief, maybe we could think about turning that into truth, and we might ha be in error. So there's different levels of this. It's an interesting research problem, which is just exactly what we're trying to do. There's also this little trick that makes things work a little faster, and that is that the belief you're sending is not a belief about what, what, uh, what your st it's not about your state. It's about the messages that are coming from your neighbors. And that's being transformed to send over. So your state is, is defined by what every, everybody tells you to yes. do. But what you admit is not what uh, you are, but what uh, you're they just believe. Integrating. So you're making one, one step further, one step mm -hmm. you know, faster. Um, message yeah, faster. I don't know how we would integrate this. I mean, I think that it is useful and we need to explore it, but we have more basic problems to tackle first at this point, I think. Yes? Do you, do you have a feel for how this, this um, belief and truth approach would s scale to the environment where the, the cadets don't entirely control where they are in the sense when you have something in the real world, there are going to be forces stronger than you mm -hmm. and they're going to be they're going to be 
odd, you know, odd uncertainties of things. The ground shifts a little bit, or mm -hmm. someone tries to shake your hand and they push a little too hard. Mm -hmm. um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a, these are really hard problems, I think. I have a hard time imagining. It seems like at that point you have nodes that may believe things that are simply wrong. And uh, I would hope transition. that I would hope that if that was true, they very quickly, based on trying to prove other things and, and other nodes trying to prove things by their wrong belief, are corrected and told that there you know there's there's issues here. You you can also imagine that. I talk about each one of these programs as being its own program. This, you know, you're going to be running localization as well as a planner, as well as some sensors, and that hopefully there'd be some quick feedback loops that would keep you honest, so to speak. In a certain sense, you want, you want a self-stabilizing truth system. Yeah. I mean, if you really could understand, if, you, if, I, if I really, if we could make some progress on taking simple rules and figuring out what the ensemble effect is, that is more attractive way to program these things. I think it will naturally be more robust. Hopefully, by going top down, we'll shed some more understanding on what it means to go bottom up. And maybe there's some subclass of things or some, some subclass of expressiveness in which you can prove those things. But that's a very long range kind of call. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much again.